uh, welcome everyone. Um, as when you're um, asking questions as well, if it's pertinent to a specific slide, most of the slides have a number at the bottom right. So um, uh, please put in the number that it's your question refers to as well, and that will help when we come back to it later. So as uh, I, because there's quite a bit to get through today, I'm trying to get um, uh, what would normally be a day, at least a day session um, into this one hour. Uh, um, I've condensed it down as much as possible. Um, but if you do have any questions, any technical questions about the content, then please feel free uh, to contact me um, and, and ask the, those, those questions in, in person. So, what I'm going to be looking at in terms of relative permeability is um, asking these three questions. Basic questions. Um, what at first, what is it relative to? Um, then how is it measured and how best to interpret the data? And what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll do, look at um, initially some definitions and uh, background, um, and then I'll look at how we measure it, including um, some of the factors that uh, uh, impact on relative permeability. Um, I'll go through three main um, processes or pr uh, methods that are used uh, for determining relative permeability. And then I'll, I'll touch on how best to interpret the data. And that will look at parameterization of data and core flood simulation. So to start off with a quick um, definitions of Describe these in some previous webinars as well. We have what's called absolute permeability, and that's the permeability of a um, sample which is 100% saturated in a single fluid, and only that fluid is flowing. Um, and, and we would refer to that as absolute perm or specific. We then have effective permeability, and effective permeability is the permeability, if you can measure it, of one fluid. Um, when that fluid is flowing, uh, but it's, there's another fluid present um, in the sample and that flu other fluid could be flowing or it could be static. It, it, um, as long as you can measure one of the, perme the permeability of one or either of the fluids, permeability to that fluid, it would be effective permeability. Sorry, I've got a plane going. No. Um, and then relative permeability, relative permeability is merely the ratio of one permeability to another permeability or the fractional ratio. Um, so it's one permeability divided by another permeability. And we, we would refer to that other permeability as base permeability or reference permeability. Um, I'm not gonna go through these um, orders because I've discussed that before. Um, the order we expect permeabilities to happen um, what I will touch on is this relative permeability. The first question you should ask yourself is what is it relative to? Um, because this is the basic equation that we're using. My relative permeability to some fluid I, um, is it equal to the effective permeability of that fluid divided by some reference or base permeability? And we have to ask ourselves, what are we basing that permeability upon? Petrophysicists and petrophysics will tend to use Klinkenberg permeability, or they may use um, water permeability. Most literature uses water permeability. Um, and often when you get um, uh, data from most laboratories, and, and, um, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's a commercial lab or um, a, a company lab, generally they tend to base it on whatever conditions the test started in. And that's, that's largely because the, the curve will then start from, from one. Uh, sometimes it might be they haven't measured the, the full base properties. Um, that may have been uh, from um, a, a different laboratory, depending on the process that's been ongoing. So I'm just going to have a quick poll here. Um, Jennifer's going to bring up that poll. So, the question is, have you or your company ever experienced uncertainties or differences in the properties of specific static or dynamic models? 
And I, I think we can sort of stop that there and show the results. And that's very similar to this morning's webinar as well. About 90% of people at some point um, see this issue, that, that there's some uncertainty and some errors between what is being used in my static model, what is being used in my dynamic model. And it's an important factor, but it's, it, um, we can take the, the poll away now. Um, the, but what, it's very easy uh, to correlate because um, if you take that basic property, the basic equation, my relative permeability for one fl particular fluid um, is relative to its effective permeability divided by a base perm, whatever that base perm may be. We can choose whatever we want to base it on. Um, and if I were to base it on a different fluid, say permeability to fluid two, then I would have a different relative permeability, but my effective permeability is equal in both of these cases. And if we bring those two um, equations together, looking at having equal um, effective permeability and rearranging the equation, we basically get this equation, um, which is how we integrate. We have a conversion factor from one base perm to another base perm, which is merely the ratio of the base perms. And, and to show how that works, here is some endpoints. Um, my KW um, is 100, KOSWI is 80 millidarcies, KWSOR is 50. Uh, and so from, if I'm using KW as the base, and I'm starting at 80 divided by 100, which gives me the 0.8, and 50 divided by 100 as the, my endpoint, which is 0.5. Now, if I were to use a different base, say KOSWI, um, then what I would have is 80 divided by 80, which is one, and 50 divided by 80, which is 0.625 end. And, and that's um, true for the endpoints, and it's true for all points on any curve, um, that it's merely just this ratio of um, permeabilities. So how do we measure it? Well, the first thing we have to realize when we're measuring relative permeability is what are we actually measuring? What is it, what is it giving you information to? Um, and so here I'm showing um, the, our net production um, is equal to our original oil in, or hydrocarbons in place times recovery efficiency. Recovery efficiency, ER, is a function of these four terms. And that's the microscopic sweep, macroscopic sweep, connected sweep, and economic efficiency. What core analysis is doing is really only looking at the microscopic sweep efficiency. We're not looking at volumetric sweep, the aerial or vertical sweep. That comes from the petrophysics and from uh, seismics and from the geology of building up your model, of characterizing all your reservoir and understanding the different layers in, in the reservoir and the different heterogeneities. So heterogeneity um, really uh, is, uh, impacts ES and ED, but what we should be looking at um, is the, for a microscopic, basically a homogeneous layer of the, of the reservoir of our microscopic sweep. And it's very important to understand that because um, the way that the, the uh, relative permeability is being implemented today, and we'll look at this as we, as I, uh, we come on, as we go through the, the webinar, um, the way that it's being used, it's being used as though uh, relative permeability is, it can impact on all of these things. So um, what are we getting what, um, when we perform what, uh, relative permeability. Um, how do we select which um, method to use and what are we getting from each method? Well, just to show you these three different methods give different areas of a relative permeability curve. We have um, the steady state method, which defines uh, quite a large saturation range and I will come on to how that's defined, and how we could control. Um, the unsteady state provides, it can be a little wider than this, sometimes it's even shorter, sometimes you may not even be able to define unsteady state, but it's this sort of area, small uh, endpoint saturation range. And then we have the centrifuge process, um, and centrifuge gives us this 
tail end of the oil curve or the displaced curve um, and an end point of the flowing injected uh, fluid. Um, and I'll come on and describe um, how, what, uh, how those are obtained. What, other thing to note here is the limitation in terms of how far down the relative permeability curve the steady state and unsteady state go. It's re usually about 10 to the negative three, whereas the centrifuge gets this long um, uh, late production tail and is, is the only one that's really getting to true residual saturation. And um, I have not, I'm not discussing true residual saturation in a great detail today, uh, but it, some people don't think it's very important, but it, it's actually very important to understand what this is um, for a proper modeling of your uh, system and of production. Wettability has a, a, a large control. So I've shown this before in a previous wettability webinar, how um, different wettabilities will give you different relative permeability curves. So it's important that we have the correct wetting when we start these tests. And then once we've considered what wettability we have, we need to consider, well, what type of state am I going to run my, my analysis in? Uh, well, we've got these three different types, fresh state, clean state, or restored state. Um, and clean state would give me water wet conditions, um, fresh state is, is, is um, using the core as soon as it comes in, um, but there are, there are issues around that depending on um, mud system. And um, so the mud that we're using in coring um, may say, well, if I use an oil-based mud and I get a lot of invasion, then I'm not really going to be able to use fresh state. And depending on the amount of surfactants in that mud system uh, may negate a fresh state testing we may have to go to restored state and um, current, the current types of oil uh, muds we're using today is more likely that we're going to go to restored state um, processes. And heterogeneity has a big impact. Um, the, the, this is a, a paper from Hamon, it's showing um, the curves here, that, so the, the, these exponential curves are the real relative permeability and what they did is they looked at um, in inputting a thin thief zone into, into a core plug or into a system and looking how that impacted on relative permeability curves. So these non-Cori style curves that we're seeing there, but once you start putting um, this thief zone in, and in this first case here, it, um, the thief zone was just 10 times the permeability of the surrounding rock. Here it was 50 times, here it's 100 times. And, and this is just a, a, a clear indication of how heterogeneity will impact the, the data. And, uh, and the first question is, well, how, how do we from, uh, get a sample that has exactly the same heterogeneity as my reservoir? Because if we were going to input the data from our core directly into our reservoir model, it would have to have exactly the same properties of the average properties of my reservoir. Um, of the heterogeneities that are there? And the answer really is we can't. So what the, the way that we're supposed to do this is drive it in a, in a layer, and in unique layers, and then build up um, details of those different layers and put them together to obtain the overall relative permeability. And that's why we're looking at microscopic in, in uh, core analysis. So how is it, how is it measured? Well, um, so this is the unsteady state method. Um, and what we're doing here is we're just injecting water through the sample um, and displacing oil and collecting the effluent sample, the effluent uh, fluids, and measuring the volumes of, of oil and water and or gas that are being produced. And um, we start off by saturating our sample and measuring water permeability and desaturating to um, initial water saturation, I, preferably with porous plate or with a centrifuge. And of course, this, these first steps, they're not gonna be possible in a fresh state analysis um, because our core fresh state is already at initial water saturation. So then we would be going uh, we wouldn't even have then this, this second portion, the aging, which is to restore wettability, because we'd be assuming wettability was maintained 
and we're going straight to a water flood. Um, and then this aging and effective SWI, they would only be performed if we were looking at restoring wetability back to uh, something that's not water wet. Um, so only in a water wet case would you consider potentially using uh, an unsteady state method with clean state um, analysis. So how, how, um, how do we measure it? What data do we get from that? Well, initially, when we start injecting um, in this uh, production curve, we get a portion of linear production. That linear production, uh, where we're only producing oil, and because water hasn't reached the end of the sample yet. Um, and uh, during that process, then obviously, with incompressible fluids, the volume of water injected will equal the volume of oil being produced. And at some point, that deviates from a linear progression. At that point is where we get the breakthrough. Um, and then what we will see is a, this curve off in the oil production and stabilization until it ceases. Um, in the differential pressure, we will see, um, depending on the viscosity, but in general, if you've got roughly similar viscosities, you'll see an increase in pressure. Um, and at the point of breakthrough, then you'll get this and decay curve in the di uh, differential pressure um, and decaying and stabilizing to some point. And um, the rate of production here is a good quality control on the rate that you've been, uh, you thought you were injecting, they should equal. So it's a good quality control point. Um, the, the point here of breakthrough, um, ensuring that breakthrough is observed at the same point in both production and differential pressure, that's another good quality control point. And then uh, checking the endpoints, checking differential pressure, calculating through by Darcy to find the endpoint relative permeability um, and with the endpoint saturation uh, are good quality control checks. Um, how is that measured? How do we determine the change in saturation and the production? Um, and how do we determine the relative permeability? Well. The production or saturation change we do generally by either volumetrics or by some non-invasive saturation monitoring process. Um, ISM. Um, gravimetrics are not recommended because it means we have to take the sample out and weigh it, put it back in again, do another portion, take it out and weigh it, and it, it's fraught with potential uh, difficulties. Um, so this is just showing you a, a PVT um, site cell. Um, in this, we can see the interface between the different fluids changing. That can be measured. If that's calibrated, we can then look at the change of volume. And the change of volume into that separator is exactly equal to the change of volume that's happening in the sample as an average saturation change. And that's accurate to about um, 0 0.03 or 0 0.05 milliliters. Um, and it, either we can use this site cell or you can use acoustic separators. A um, uh, number of laboratories will also use uh, test tubes and, and, uh, and flasks and determine volumes captured in those uh, tubes. Um, it's maybe slightly less accurate than this, but it's still to something like 0.1 milliliter or something um, similar. And, and the, the calculation is simple, it's just saturation, whatever my original saturation was in my core, um, uh, plus or minus the production volume divided by my pore volume um, will give me my current saturation, saturation at the, at the end of the test. And if I'm in imbibition, then I've got water saturation increasing. We normally discuss it in terms of water saturation, um, so water saturation increasing would be the positive and water saturation decreasing gives me the drainage and, and, and I'm using the negative term in that um, analysis. By in-situ saturation monitoring, I'm using, um, so that's volumetrics, in-situ saturation, we're measuring it directly. Uh, we would, uh, we have to take calibration scans um, in 0% um, um, water, so uh, no water present, then we could saturate with the water and we can take another scan 
and do it with 100% water present and see how the difference between those uh, counts are, are showing. And then any difference between those two calibration ends gives me the saturation. And, and that's calculated using the Beer-Lambert law. Um, so the uh, calculation or the equation down here, which is a, a log-based uh, process, um, gives me my saturation. And then we need to control that. We need to look at um, the accuracy of that. And there are various things that can impact on the accuracy of that test data. Um, so the test conditions can change the attenuation coefficient of my samples. Um, the, radi the radioactive source may um, change its intensity over time or depending on uh, the conditions it's in as well. And so there are various things that could impact on that. But basically, it all comes down to the number of counts uh, taken when taking that measurement. And, and the error, uh, the standard deviation in my, um, uh, my saturation is basically a function, the square root of the counts taken. So if I have not taken enough counts, I will have a large error. If I've taken uh, um, many enough counts and a whole of a small error and we're trying to get that error down to about um, plus or minus one saturation unit. Um, so uh, this is the next poll for you. Um, a quick uh, question. How many counts do you think generally on average needed to get saturation below uh, that plus or minus one error? Is it 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 500,000 counts. So that's, uh, we can uh, stop it there. It's roughly um, a little bit, um, the most popular is 100,000, next 50,000, and then 10,000. So it, it's actually, uh, about correct, it's somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 counts for the standard way that our um, industry works. So that is by adding a, a doped fluid into one of the phases. And what the dopant does is it changes the attenuation and gives a better contrast between the attenuating fluids, the two different fluids. Um, if you had no um, uh, no dopant present, then you would probably ha have it be having to go to, to something like a million or greater counts to actually get the, the standard deviation down sufficiently. So that's um, saturation. How do we calculate RELPERM? Well, from this unsteady state process, it's, it's actually quite a complex process because um, we're measuring average saturations. Um, uh, but our differential pressure is across a sample, um, and um, it was uh, buckley leverett uh, we, We're generally using a buckley leverett theory, and this johnson bosler nauman came up with a, a differential process of breaking the, the, the weld equation, which is the equation given up the top right there, breaking it down into its constituent, constituent parts to calculate rel perm. Now, a lot of old methods used um, high viscosity ratios to try and displace through the process. Um, because I mentioned earlier that sometimes relative permeabilities may, may not be uh, uh, calculable from this collection process because you have to have both water and oil being produced um, uh, at, at some known ratios. Um, and if you don't have any additional um, production past breakthrough, then you won't be able to measure uh, a, a relative permeability. And, and that's controlled partly by the rates that we're performing and partly by the wettability of the sample or the conditions that we're under. And so what, what, um, what an old technique used to be was to, um, to force early breakthrough and to force the system to be able to have water and oil being produced and get a, a little more definition on the curve. And this is how it's done. So this, this is how Weld's equation is used. We derive fractional flow curves from, from it. And in a, 
um, fairly good reasonable mobility ratio. So the mobility ratio is this term here in the Wells equation. Um, with a, a fairly similar mobility ratio, you get later breakthrough, the point of break where, uh, where it, um, this line touches the curve as a tangent um, is at the point of breakthrough. Um, with a high mobility ratio, you get earlier breakthrough with a longer tail. So then I, I have the potential of defining um, from here onwards, whilst here I'm only defining maybe 10 saturation units. Um, however, there are, there, are, there are some problems with that process because you're actually um, creating an unstable flip front to calculate a process that is based on a stable flip, uh, flip front. Um, and, and so you're, you're breaking the, uh, the assumptions of Buckley Leverett to then go and use Buckley Leverett to, um, to obtain your data. Um, so there are better ways of doing this, and I'll come on to show you those later. The advantages of the unsteady state data process, though, are it is the, the process that, that is most like what's happening in your reservoir injecting or one fluid moving and pushing another uh, fluid um, in, in front of it. The disadvantages are things like capillary boundary effects um, and, and the fact that you're going to have to use pretty high uh, forces and flow rates to get anywhere close to the real relative permeability data. So that's unsteady state. Steady state, how do we, how do we determine that? Well, um, we have basically the same process beforehand, but then when we come to the test, we, we inject simultaneously water and oil. Um, and we do it at, at, at controlled fractional flow rates. Um, we will have then two pumps that we're using in the system, one for water, one for oil. Um, and we would set out a plan, something like this, with different fractional flow rates. Um, at one uh, total flow rate, you usually keep total flow rate um, constant, but you don't need to. Um, and But you would build up uh, these fractional flows and you would get a series of data that looks something like this. So here's your production at the different fractions. So each of these steps is a different fraction. Here's my differential pressure at those different fractions. And these will be my, this is from in-situ saturation monitoring, the, the, scan, the saturation scans at each of those different uh, fractions. And this is then it turned into the relative permeability curve. Um, and here we've uh, put on a standard Cori fit or approximation to those uh, curves. And, and this is easier for relative permeability because we're injecting water at a known flow rate with a differential pressure. And so we can just determine the effective permeability for water, divide it by whatever base permeability is being used and get the relative permeability for water. We can do the same for oil. We're injecting at a known rate of oil for, the, for that differential pressure, gives us the effective permeability to oil, divided by my base perm, gives me the relative permeability. To oil. And then we correlate it together with the saturation. So that's steady state process. And then we've got the centrifuge process. And the centrifuge, we're placing the sample into um, a centrifuge, we're spinning the sample, and uh, we're applying um, basically increasing gravity forces. And this is a gravity displacement rather than um, viscous displacement. But it means we're able to apply very high forces which can allow us to reduce significantly the end effects uh, and get to something close to the true residual oil uh, saturation, as long as the sample conditions and wettability allow So just to re uh, repeat and, sh and show again, the different regions that the different tests are uh, um, providing. So my steady state defines a large wide saturation range. My unsteady state, um, which is the most similar to the reservoir process, um, gives me uh, a small range. Um, and the centrifuge, which is the one that gets close to, closest to the end point, 
uh, gives me defines only one of the curves. It doesn't give me the displaced, uh, the displacing phase. It only gives me the displaced phase of of relative permeability plus one endpoint of the displacing phase. And th this just shows you um, in unsteady state we can perform it in, in just about any test state under depending on the lab laboratory equipment under en most conditions and with any fluid pair whereas in the centrifuge we have some limitations um, so it can, some centrifuges can perform at elevated pressure and temperature but it may be somewhat limited um, and um, it becomes very difficult to do inhibition processes if the uh, gas is present um, and this is just to show that you only get one of the phases um, in, in, in a single run. And this is this also, and I, I know it's, there's too much to sh um, take in rapidly. So if, if people want, we can provide a slide pack. This just shows you the, what each of the different um, processes give uh, for different aspects of, of test and its, its impact. And, and one thing to note in particular though, in terms of rel perm calculation, the unsteady state and steady state are, are limited um, to about 10 to the negative three, uh, whilst the centrifuge can get to much lower rel perm values. So how best, uh, just to come finish off, how best to interpret the data? Well, let's start um, by thinking about what we're using it for. Um, and, and I have to say that very often relative permeability is statistically underrepresentative, upper, up, underrepresented. Um, for petrophysics and for electrical properties, we, you're generally getting at least somewhere between five to 10 and sometimes more samples um, per, uh, per rock type um, to, to define a reservoir property. Very often with relative permeability, you may only have one, uh, one rel perm. And that one rel perm is meant to describe the whole of that system. Um, and as we've seen earlier, heterogeneities have a, a, a potential significant impact. So it, it's therefore sometimes difficult to determine um, whether the re relative permeability is controlled by specific relative uh, reservoir controls, reservoir properties. Um, but if, if you've seen enough of these data, like I have, or if you have a, a reservoir where you have these properties and you do a proper quality control process and review them, you will generally find that these, um, the controls on relative permeability are linked to reservoir properties. So just as a, a, we, we know from capillary pressure data and from petrophysics that SWI is linked to um, permeability, but absolute permeability, or it might be RQI, or you may use FZI, um, but you'll find that then the subsequent um, effective permeabilities usually uh, have some function and correlation to the, that base perm. Um, my residual saturations can sometimes be linked to my initial saturation, Sometimes it's linked to the um, base permeability as well. And my endpoint permeability at the end of the test can often also be correlated to the basic the base permeability. And this allows us to actually then derive a series of rel perm curves based on the properties of the, of the cell in our model or of the layer that we're particularly interested in, rather than having a single tabular input, which is what most are. And what you'll find in terms of the curvature of the, you not always, but sometimes you will find those correlate also to some reservoir properties. So the first thing I do is I begin to go through and look at, can I parameterize my rel perms? What's controlling the endpoints and the curvature? I will then start looking at core flood simulation. Um, and this is necessary because in the rel perm test, and this is a difficult concept maybe to, to get, this is about some of the most complex physics that we probably do in, in, in SCAL. Uh, 
Um, but what we have when we're performing relative permeability tests, we have something called mutual interference. We, because we've got capillary pressure and relative permeability acting in this small sample. Now the capillary pressure is not really relevant to the, the reservoir scale because of the long length scale that's involved in the reservoir. But in these short samples, the capillary pressure has a, a strong controlling factor. It controls saturation. And, and, and what we find, we know from capillary pressure and, and say height above free water level from that, that uh, capillary pressure and the saturation is linked to a pressure gradient between the fluids, so a fluid pressure gradient. And when we perform a relative permeability or any permeability um, a process, we, we get a differential pressure. We, we instill a pressure gradient and we, we will get a fluid pressure gradient when we've got more than one fluid uh, um, flowing. So what we'll have is that in, at the injection phase, we will have some uh, differential pressure and also some fluid pressure gradient, and that is reducing down to almost zero. It's never quite exactly zero, um, but it's almost zero at the outlet of the sample. What that means is I've got a pressure gradient in my sample, but with a pressure gradient uh, and capillary pressure acting, I will also get a saturation gradient. Um, so if I were to perform this test at different flow rates, um, at a low rate, say 10 times the rate and 100 times that original rate, I get a different pressure gradient acting in my sample. And that pressure gradient on a, a capillary pressure curve, I could read off where that is. Um, so here we're maybe at, at one pressure unit. So on, I look at one pressure unit here and I, I get 75% saturation. Um, along the sample here, um, halfway at the sample, I've, I've got half a, a pressure unit. So I will be somewhere here at 65 saturation units. And so depending on the, the rate and the pressure gradient, I get these different saturation gradients happening in my, uh, in my sample. Now, if I've got a saturation gradient, we know that saturation and relative permeability are linked. Relative permeability is a function of the saturation present. And so if I've got changing saturation at different sections along my sample, I've got, I'm, I don't have a different rel perm, it's just my effective perm is based on, on say here on the rel perm curve or here on the rel perm curve or here on the rel perm curve, depending on what the saturation is at the point of in that sample. Uh, and, and this is a, a potentially a difficult concept to really understand. But these, these are actual, um, showing uh, some actual derived um, gradients and saturations, which leads to change. This is the relative permeability, um, the impact on relative permeability that this great saturation gradient has. Um, so you can see that the, the relative, it's all the same relative permeability curve, but you've got different actual points um, acting because of this changing saturation. What does that mean? Well, if I were to perform a test at um, a low rate, um, then I, I may obtain from standard analytical processes, which assume the capillary pressure is negligible, I will get this data out. If I were to increase my flow rate, and this, is, this was based on some actual test results, um, and I obtain the additional um, data and, and calculate relative permeability at a higher rate, this is the curve that I obtain. Uh, these ones here, these are just showing the same curves in Cartesian, the semi-log. Um, at a very high rate, I've got this, and we can see at the very high rate, my water relative permeability is very close or probably overlaying the true water relative permeability curve. And that's the true curve here. That's the true curve for um, oil. Um, but what we see is none of the oil curves are actually um, correct. So how do, I do, how do I get the real rel perm curve? Um, and these are, these are just showing you some other in-situ monitoring, show, showing you the measurement of that capillary pressure curve. So depending on wettability,
and the rates and, and test uh, conditions, you will get different curves. We have to use simulation. Um, so there's a, a last uh, poll here, I believe, um, which Jennifer will, will start. Um, so do you or your company regularly use core flood simulation uh, to derive your relative permeability? Okay, we'll, we'll stop that there in the interest of time. And, and that's, that's very similar to this morning. Um, uh, uh, roughly 50-50, a little less than 50 use uh, simulation. And I, I would strongly recommend um, that, uh, the need to use simulation uh, to derive your rel perm curves, because without it, you don't, you're not quite sure whether it's the, you've got the correct data or it's being impacted by those capillary forces or not. How do, how do we do the simulation? Well, we, um, we take all the flood information, um, the injection rates, production rates and pressures, um, the orientation of the core, the fluid properties, um, and, and then we obtain uh, uh, by either in the same core or a different uh, core plug, we get a capillary pressure curve that's in the same saturation history. So if I'm doing an imbibition process, I get an imbibition capillary pressure curve if I'm in with the same fluids. If I'm in a drainage process, I get a drainage capillary pressure curve that uh, I can input with my simulations and find history match my core flood data. Um, ISM scans, they're, they're optional as well, but if you don't have this, the, these two portions, um, you may have uh, non-unique solutions. Um, and this is just showing you here the, the simulation process. So I input a relative permeability or a, uh, sorry relative permeability curves and a capillary pressure data um, either as a model or table into the, the simulator um, and from that I can derive um, the, the production data so here's um, um, uh, this is how it sets up it, it, it's, it um, splits the sample into many slices um, at least 30 is should is recommended um, uh, generally, I tend to use uh, 50. Um, and this is an unsteady state test. So in, in this test, we've got an initial uh, flow rate. There's my differential pressure from the initial flow rate and the production. Um, I then increase pressure, uh, sorry, increase the flow rate. I get the increased pressure and a, and a new production. And then I do increase again, I get an increase in pressure and a new production. And then for, um, so from this capillary pressure curve and this set of rel perm data, I've derived uh, that match to the, my data. And this is the match to the saturation measured by in-situ monitoring. And you can see you've got a very good match here. And so you can have good confidence in the rel perm data and that capillary pressure that, that's come with it. Um, here's a different one for steady state. Again, I can see the good match to my data and to my um, uh, saturation uh, data and we can and this is just showing you um, the impact that different portions of the curves may have so here's my original KRO KRW uh, capillary pressure this is my differential pressure if I change my KRO um, it has a minor change in production and some change in differential pressure and there's some small change in saturation as well it's difficult to see um, but if I change capillary pressure, so here's, here's capillary, so the original rel perms, but with a different capillary pressure, it has a significant impact. It significantly changes my, um, my saturation curves. It significantly changes my differential pressure. The capillary pressure has a, a strong controlling um, impact on my rel perm curves. So in conclusion, how, how do we measure and, and control relative permeability. Well, it's best to perform under re representative wettability. It's essential to do that. It's essential to perform with representative samples and fluids. We should QC the data and check those properties, derive correlations to reservoir properties if we have sufficient data available, um, and use core flood simulation to derive the relative permeability curves. 
thank you for your attention um, and we'll open up to any questions that people uh, may have and I'll, I'll, I'll start saying and, and again it, it's it's uh, there's a lot of information to get into this um, and and uh, if people want to ask me questions outside of here here's my uh, email address feel free to contact me um, and ask any questions you may have on this is these issues um, so one uh, question uh, coming in uh, if the number of counts goes up won't the standard deviation also go, go up yes um, but what you'll see is that, that that it's the standard deviation is the is the root of the counts so although that you um, so the counts will go up the, the, and the root of the counts will also go up, but it won't go up in the same um, the same volume or the same amount as the as the counts are, are increasing. So as you get greater and greater accounts, although this is increasing, although the error is increasing as well, um, it's increasing. Uh, it, it's actually the overall error is decreasing over time. Um, uh, the next one is 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 it possible? Oh, uh, sorry. Um, hi, thank you for your interesting presentation. It would be great if we had a chance to make a, a, a practice of core flood simulation as part of the, this presentation. I actually, <coughs> excuse me, um, I've, I've actually have some um, a core flood course, um, core flood simulation um, course, a three, three day one that I've been looking at putting together. Um, I can do a, 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 a simulation, just focusing on simulation and course. Um, I presented one for the Society of Core Analysts um, a couple of years ago. Um, so that's something I could do if people were interested in, in, a, in that sort of webinar. Um, is it possible to obtain a relative permeability curves from production curves of a core flood? Um, um, yes, um, but as I've been describing, you do need these the this additional data, and and I would recommend um, performing um, simulation where possible. Um, so uh, the deriving KR from production curves is is how the relative permeability is derived from uh, from the test data. Um, could I um, uh, share the presentation slides? Yes, we will do that. Um, but for people who get in contact and, and ask, um, we'll, we'll supply um, a PDF slide pack. Uh, which is most reliable method for measuring absolute permeability, steady state or an unsteady state? Uh, and uh, that's as long as, it, as, as everything else is controlled, um, steady state is generally the, the best. Um, for a gas, uh, for a liquid, it, they're, they're roughly even um, because you've got in, uh, you've got non-compressible fluids, um, but for gas, because of the compressibility of gas, um, then it's always best to wait for the for steady state. Um, what's the minimum value of plug air permeability to be used for measuring relative permeability? Um, that's a difficult one. Um, in, in general, it depends on the limits of the laboratory equipment. So different laboratories may have different limits. Um, and it, and uh, also because um, the forces are higher in a centrifuge, um, it will be different from a centrifuge to um, flooding, which is why the centrifuge can, is able to get much closer to the true residuals um, because we're able to apply much higher forces. There's also um, in the centrifuge, you don't have the uh, potential for instability. It will always be a stable um, uh, uh, frontal flow. Um, I can't put any specific numbers on that because it, it varies de um, depending on fluid properties as well and the actual, uh, whether you're at elevated temperatures or you're looking at ambient systems. Um, but you're generally looking at probably somewhere around about 1, 0.1 to 1 millidarcy 
but there are a number of papers over the last two years looking at, um, at uh, deriving uh, processes for low permeability systems. I haven't discussed them here. Um, I was just looking at the three main methods, but there are other ways of potentially trying to determine relative permeability for low perm systems. Um, would you recommend using Klinkenberg permeability or liquid permeability during SCAL um, to obtain representative absolute permeability at reservoir conditions? Um, I, I think you, you have to, uh, it, it, it varies. I, what I didn't go to uh, in, at the start was the general order of how we, we tend to see relative permeability. So um, gas perm the highest, Klinkenberg is, is smaller and theoretically oil perm and water perm should be roughly the same. Uh, but what uh, a number of reservoirs have, have been uh, showing over the last uh, number of years is that sometimes water permeability, absolute water permeability is much lower than uh, the absolute um, gab, gas perm or the Klinkenberg permeability, which they should be roughly equal um, if everything was uh, consistent, but and and that nobody yet has a, a there are there are three uh, as far as I'm aware there are three main um, conjectured thoughts on what might be happening there. Two of them are to do with uh, fluid rock or fluid mineral interactions, and one of them is to do with um, a potential locational turbulence um, because of um, a poor geometry. Um, and, and, and particularly through uh, uh, um, high clay content regions where the clay disrupts the, the, the geometry and, and leaves, um, leaves it open to more potential turbulent effects. Um, what I would say is you, you, you need to understand both Finkenberg and water permeability, and if there are differences there, you need to do some further study to look at what you believe is controlling um, the difference between there before you de um, decide which one you're going to use uh, as your reference permeability. Um, so sometimes I would, I would be recommending using Klinkenberg. It might be the most um, pertinent for one reservoir. For another reservoir, it might be uh, water permeability. Um, in steady state measurement, where Darcy is used to calculate the effective perm, does the area changes for oil and water? Um, yes. So when 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 you uh, you input, um, you you start off with a low fractional flow rate, say um, five percent water. Um, there will be a change in saturation. It won't be 5% change in saturation. It could be 10, maybe 20, depends on wettability. Um, but you'll go from say 20% to 30 or 40% water saturation. Um, once you've achieved that stable saturation, 40% of the pore space is filled with water and the 60 is filled with oil. So then yes, you've got uh, different areas uh, for, of flow for oil and water. You then increase the flow rate and you may go from 40% water to 50% water. Um, and so now you're, you're at 50-50 in terms of the, the area, aerial flow um, of water and oil. And as you increase, as the water fraction increases increasing, you get um, changes in water saturation that change the aerial flow uh, um, for water. And what's the minimum required pore volume for successful relative permeability tests? <laughs> um, again, that will depend on what method you're using. Um, if you're using a volumetric uh, test, it, it will depend on how low in or how high an acceptable error you're willing to accept. Um, so you may get up to so I was saying that the error is 0 0.03 milliliters. Well, if your um, plug is only one milliliter in, in size, then 0 0.03 of one is a 3% error just in the potential 
uh, distance of, um, of measurement. Um, but by in situ monitoring, if we perform and control that properly, then the error should always be plus or minus 1% because we should um, calculate ahead what we think the, um, the properties are going to be for, of, of the counts so that we, we measure enough counts to bring the error down to that level. Um, two questions left and I'll, I'll, I'll finish with these, with these two. Um, I'm not going to inject oil into my reservoir, so why would I want to <laughs> choose the steady state method? Um, correct, um, and, and it, it does not represent, that's one of the, the, the disadvantages of the steady state method, it does not represent the reservoir process. But it's not designed to represent the reservoir process. The problem with the unsteady state method is that you may not define, you may have 20% um, saturation and the first, um, the first saturation point that you next have maybe 60 or 65% or water. And so you have uh, then this large 45% 40, um, pore volume missing um, of, of data. What the steady state um, process is designed to do is to fill the saturations between that large gap um, and, and try and describe um, a fuller uh, saturation range. Um, why only the displaced phase curve with like centrifuge? And, and that's because um, we don't, um, in the centrifuge, we, we're only measuring one phase. So we, we can't really get a relative permeability um, from, from a, uh, of the water relative permeability because we've got no data on, on the water um, production uh, from that process. So we can't, we can't calculate it. And I'll, 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 have, I'll do one more question because I did say it would only be two. Um, and if I haven't answered your questions, we, we will uh, get in contact with you and, and answer them uh, by, uh, by mail or I can give you um, a call if, I, if I've got your contact details and we can discuss it in person. Um, so the last one is uh, relative permeability from mercury injection or uh, digital rock is useful or a waste of time. Um, I, this was a similar question this morning and um, it, it, it can be useful. Um, what you do notice uh, or what, what, is, what has not been able to be done so far by digital rocks is to produce a relative permeability um, exactly like the, the, the core plug or a scal data set. Um, but some of that may be just uncertainties in, um, in the processes that have been used. Um, in digital rock properties, there was a good paper by um, uh, Professor Ken Sorby a number of years back that showed that uh, he, where he was saying digital rock properties will always only be history matching of data. Um, it will never be predictive because there are too many variables um, in the process of image processing um, and deriving the pore space from those images and then um, in, in, in um, imputing a rel perm and capillary pressure test. So there's something like a minimum of 12 variables and that's, that gives too many degrees of freedom. Um, and so we always have to tune it into some real um, laboratory data, but where it's useful is, is once you've got that a history match to some laboratory data, you can begin to look at sensitivity analysis by um, tweaking small things like wettability or uh, other properties that you would take a long time in the laboratory to do. Um, and MICP is a difficult one because MICP it's giving you the, the pore size, it, it, well, it's similar to the digital rocks, you're, you're obtaining something, but you don't know the actual uh, wettability, you don't know the distribution of the clays, the actual, where those actual clays are and how wettability is actually distributed. So you're still having to make some um, estimations of that and some 
um, averaging of, of that um, system to derive any profit. So again, thank you uh, for attention. And um, uh, if I haven't asked, answered any of your questions, we will be in contact to do so.